Everyone knows about Cain and Abel, but what about Adam and Eve's 54 other kids? The story of Adam and Eve's other children is an often overlooked one, and when it comes to their daughters, things get pretty weird. The Bible has a reputation as a single, infallible document, but it actually took a long time for the early Christian church to decide which stories to include in the sacred text. Over the course of more than 400 years, lots of freshly minted Christians wrote books that didn't make the final cut. One of them is called the Book of the Daughters of Adam. In 494 AD, Pope Gelasius included it on a list of texts that he wanted everyone to know were not church-approved. The book reportedly gave Adam's daughters names and life stories, and it wasn't the only text to do so. Literature about Adam and his family had been a popular subject for hundreds of years, as explained by the book The Many Faces of Christ, the thousand-year story of the survival and influence of the Lost Gospels. Other texts that touch upon Adam and Eve's daughters include the Jewish Book of Jubilees and the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, among others. Everyone knows about their sons Cain and Abel, but clearly people wanted to know a little something about these women. Women, 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 women. Unfortunately, the books of the daughters of Adam is lost to history, but one text that has survived is the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan which was included in the Forgotten Books of Eden in 1926. This book is unambiguous about when Adam and Eve's first daughter shows up. After they've been thrown out of Eden and Eve gets pregnant, she goes into labor, just like in the book of Genesis. But in the Bible, she only gives birth to a son, while the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan says, And God looked at his maidservant Eve and delivered her, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and with him a daughter. So, according to this unofficial version, the first live birth on Earth was twins, and one of them was a girl. According to the text, after eight days, Adam and Eve finally got around to naming the kids. The boy was named Cain, just like in the Bible, while the girl was named Belua. With an entire world to populate, Adam and Eve couldn't stop at just two children. According to the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, after the twins Cain and Lelua finished breastfeeding, Eve again conceived, and when her days were accomplished, she brought forth another son and daughter, and they named their son Abel and their daughter Aklia. The text doesn't seem interested in these two twins, at least surrounding their birth. There's no explanation for what either of their names mean or why they were given them, and there's no hint about whether there was any interwomb conflict. An interesting note from the end of the chapter on Abel and Aklia's birth is that it reports, after the birth of these, Eve ceased from childbearing. This is true at least until after Abel's murder, when she gives birth to her son Seth as kind of a replacement. At that point, we learn that there weren't any more offspring, although this is a direct contradiction to what's in the Bible. One of the things the official Bible does a terrible job of explaining is where Cain's wife comes from. He just suddenly has one, even though at that point, the only people in the world are Cain and his parents. So unless he married his mom, where did this wife come from? If Cain had sisters, then he at least had options. It might be grossed out at the prospect of him marrying his sister, but at least he didn't marry his twin, Lelua. For her part, Lelua didn't remain unspoken for. She married Abel before he was killed. In fact, the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan even claims that Lelua was the cause of Abel's murder. Cain, who hated her even as an embryo, got mad when Satan told him that Adam and Eve were going to have Lelua marry Abel, while Cain would be stuck with Aklia. Cain wasn't happy about this because Lulua was apparently much more attractive than her sister. Other texts trace the disagreement to Abel and Aklia having a triplet sister and claim the fight was over who would get a second wife. According to the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, Cain was always a jerk to Abel when they were growing up. So when Satan appeared and told him that his younger brother was going to get to marry his sister, who was essentially the most beautiful woman on earth at the time, it sent Cain over the edge. Fortunately, Satan had just the solution for him. All Cain had to do was eliminate the other male competition on the planet, and he'd get to choose his sister as his wife. The text says that Cain tried to kill Abel multiple times. It doesn't explain how or why he failed, although it might have something to do with the fact that at the time, they were barely even teenagers. Maybe killing your own brother is more of a grown man's game. Adam and Eve eventually decided that their sons needed wives. When Cain found out it was true that he had to marry Aklia, he cursed his mother. After the brothers made offerings to God and Abel's was accepted and Cain's rejected, just like in the official Bible, Cain took Abel for a stroll and then killed him. The Bible tells us that after Cain killed Abel, he was banished to wander in the land of Nod. This is when an unexplained, unnamed wife appears as described by Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. That's the first and last time that Cain's wife is mentioned after being conjured seemingly out of thin air and not even given a name. The conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan goes into much more detail. 
Adam and Eve weren't particularly happy about one son killing the other, but at least as far as Cain was concerned, it worked out, as he got to marry his twin sister Lulua. The land of Nod isn't mentioned here, only that Cain took Lulua away to live near the place he killed Abel. To modern sensibilities, that sounds like a premise straight out of a horror movie. And since there was still a whole planet to populate, it got worse for Lulua, as the text explains, his sister bore him children, who in their turn began to multiply by degrees until they filled that place. The book of Genesis mentions that Cain and his wife had a son named Enoch and that Cain built a city and named it after his son. But other sources have expanded on those stories, almost as a sort of biblical fan fiction. In this case, it was the great Jewish historian Josephus who lived in the Middle East in the first century AD. His work, Antiquities of the Jews, adds some details about what Cain got up to in Enoch, and from there we can infer what Lelua's life would have been like. The short answer? It was terrible. Cain had learned nothing from his punishment for killing his brother. He did well for himself in Enoch as he accumulated great wealth, but he got it by means of violence, robbery, and pillaging. He became a leader of men, but he led them into wickedness. He invents weights, measures, and property boundaries, which may sound innocent enough, though it did lead to people practicing so-called cunning craftiness. So Lulua would have been married to the most important guy in the city with lots of money, but all of it procured through evil means. With Abel dead and Cain banished, this left no more brothers for Akli to marry. After Adam and Eve took seven years to deal with their grief, they decided to have another kid. It was a boy, and they named him Seth. According to the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, when Seth was nine, Satan appeared and tempted him, but Seth wasn't swayed, and he went home and told his parents. This is when Adam decided that his prepubescent son needed a wife to keep him in line and make sure that if Satan tempted Seth again, he would continue to hold strong. This seems like a lot of pressure to put on a wife, but things were obviously very different back then. The only wife available to Seth was, of course, Aklia. Let's spare a thought for this girl who apparently was so undesirable that her brother murdered her twin so they didn't have to marry her, and now she's stuck in a cave with her parents. Now nobody bothers to ask her if she wants to marry this new brother. The text does at least give us Seth's thoughts about the matchmaking by noting, Seth, however, did not wish to marry, but in obedience to his father and mother, he said not a word. While the Bible doesn't mention where Cain's wife came from, the apocryphal additions to the story do make sense, even if they kind of have to jump through hoops to make everything fit. Since Lulua and Aklia aren't mentioned in the official Bible, most people haven't heard of them. This could lead to the question, were there even more children? Weirdly, the Bible actually does say something about this. According to Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. That's right, while the official version of the Bible doesn't mention Lulua or Aklia, it does indeed say that Adam went on to have daughters. In 800 years, you can have a lot of kids. Thus, according to accepted scripture, Adam and Eve could theoretically have had any number of daughters. This is where the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan goes against something the Bible says directly, since it states that Adam and Eve only had five kids and that Seth was the last. Jewish tradition records just how many kids Adam and Eve had, as they were apparently a total of 56 children. 33 sons and 23 daughters. This makes sense as God did tell them to be fruitful and multiply. Five kids just wouldn't cut it. Since the Bible is an anthology of books written by different people, it contradicts itself a lot. But one of the things that's clear about very early on is that incest is not okay. You probably know the Ten Commandments, but there are actually many more commandments that God gave to Moses. The Lord Jehovah has given unto you these 15, 10, Ten Commandments! When it comes to incest, God does not leave any room for doubt. According to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 6, No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. God then lists 11 different variations of incest and why each one specifically is unacceptable. The key one in Lelua and Aklia's situations is Leviticus chapter 18, verse 9. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. This is essentially repeated in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 17, when God declares, If a man marries his sister, the daughter of either his father or his mother, and they have sexual relations, it is a disgrace. So, is this just another case of biblical contradiction? From one perspective, Cain and Lelua didn't break God's commandment because it hadn't yet been decreed. So, at the time, they technically weren't doing anything wrong. It's a bit creepy. Very creepy. The Garden of Eden is one of the most famous settings in the Bible peaceful garden oasis God created as a home for Adam and Eve before they made a dumb mistake that got them evicted. Here's the untold truth of the Garden of Eden. 
The main appearance of the Garden of Eden in the canonical Bible is, of course, in the book of Genesis, during the second account of creation that begins in chapter 2. Verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. If you know of the Garden of Eden at all, you probably know the Genesis narrative. Eden was the place where God made a home for the first humans, filled with all sorts of plants and animals, including the famous tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which Adam and Eve were specifically instructed not to eat from. This is the tree of knowledge. From its branches you shall not eat. Are you saying that in like a, I suggest you don't, or in like a definitely don't? People being people, of course, they went ahead and did it anyway. God kicked them out of the garden, leaving behind angels to keep the now sinful humans from having access to the tree of life. Adam and Eve subsequently invented the idea of working for a living and raised children who invented the concept of murder. Of course, humans didn't just come up with this terrible idea themselves. No, it was the serpent who convinced Eve to go give that apple a whirl. She not only ate the fruit, of course, but also shared it with Adam, bringing about the fall of man and leading to their expulsion from the garden. According to the Bible, this is why, in short, life sucks and then you die. So what's the deal with the serpent? Well, popular modern interpretation commonly teaches that the serpent was actually the devil in disguise. In fact, for Christians, God's promise to the serpent that Eve's offspring would crush him is a prophecy foretelling Jesus' ultimate victory over Satan in the end times. One problem, though. The Eden serpent was not actually Satan. How do we know? Well, according to biblical archaeology, when the book of Genesis was composed, the idea of the devil hadn't even been invented yet. The idea of a powerful supernatural force who opposes God didn't develop until several hundred years after Genesis was written. Whoops. According to Genesis 3.24, when God drove Adam and Eve out of Eden, he placed cherubim and a flaming spinning sword at the east entrance to keep humans from ever entering the garden again. A flaming sword is pretty easy to picture. But what are cherubim? Nowadays, we tend to think of cherubs as chubby angel babies thanks to their having been conflated with cupids and pudi from Roman mythology and Italian art. The cherubim in the Bible are, uh, somewhat different. Cherubim are often described in Ezekiel as mashups of humans, oxen, eagles, and lions, beings who hold up God's throne and move unflinchingly forward like unturning chariot wheels. This likely relates to the statues of cherubim on the mercy seat, which was the cover of the Ark of the Covenant where God himself was known to sit. The Jewish encyclopedia suggests the idea of enormous beings of great power without human emotion as representatives of gods and protectors of holy spaces is an ancient Semitic belief that can also be found in the winged bulls and lions at Babylonian and Assyrian temple entrances. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, for the scholars behind the Jewish theological writings known as the Talmud and the esoteric school of Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah, there are actually two Gardens of Eden. One of these is the earthly garden where Adam and Eve lived and ate fruit and played with penguins or whatever, and the other is a celestial paradise where the immortal souls of the righteous live. These two concepts are distinguished by referring to a lower and higher Garden of Eden, or calling the earthly location Gan garden, and the heavenly one, Eden. As the Jewish Encyclopedia explains, various apocalyptic writings describe Eden as a place for the righteous who suffer innocently, who do works of benevolence and walk without blame before God. Those who make it to the celestial Eden will wear clothes made of light and enjoy the immortality that comes from the tree of life. The wicked will suffer sevenfold punishment, while the righteous will enjoy sevenfold happiness, living in mansions and walking with God who leads them in dance. A question that has been asked and debated for centuries is the location of the physical Garden of Eden. After all, if you knew there was a place with talking animals, a flaming sword, and a tree that could let you live forever, you'd want to at least grab an Instagram selfie there. Naturally, the biblical account is the starting place for most people who assume the garden was more than a metaphor. Genesis chapter 2 says Eden had a river flowing out of it that spread into four branches. Two are identified as the Tigris and Euphrates in modern-day Iraq. But the other two have been a little harder to pin down. Traditionally, the third river is believed to flow through India, making it either the Indus or the Ganges, and the fourth is said to be in or near Ethiopia, meaning most believe it to be the Nile. But these are traditional guesses, right? A lot of people have their own ideas about where the Garden of Eden actually is or was. For centuries, people have looked everywhere from the depths of the Persian Gulf to rural Missouri and even the planet Mars. 
The Mormons, for instance, teach that after being driven out of Eden, Adam and Eve settled into a land known as Adam Undi Aman, which is located in modern-day Missouri. Joseph Smith is said to have received a divine revelation upon witnessing a rock formation that resembled an altar that this place was where Adam blessed his descendants and made offerings to God. Then there's archaeologist Yaris Zarens, who in 1987 told the Smithsonian that the story of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden was a metaphor for society's transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. He posited that the literal Garden of Eden is now underwater at the head of the Persian Gulf, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers empty into the sea. And then there's Armenia. Many people, including the famous English poet Lord Byron, believe that the Garden of Eden was at the origin of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Armenia rather than at the end of the Persian Gulf. They also point to the fact that Mount Ararat, the final resting place for Noah's Ark, is located on the Armenian plain as well. So what's the truth? Well, that's one bit of knowledge that the serpent's apple didn't seem to grant us. Ironic, isn't it? The Bible's Queen Esther has had a recent surge in popularity. People love the story of a Jewish peasant girl rising to the rank of queen and eventually saving her entire people. But Queen Esther's story is more than that. Here are some weird things you didn't know about Queen Esther. Here's a brief and unofficial summation of Esther's story to get us started. Long ago in Persia, the queen angered the king, so he dumped her and picked a new queen, Esther, who was secretly Jewish. But when her cousin Mordecai got in trouble, the big bad guy Haman decided to kill all the Jewish people. So Esther threw a banquet and revealed to the king that she herself was Jewish. He took her aside, Haman ended up dead, and now to celebrate, we get Purim and triangle-shaped cookies. The End. But actually, there's a lot more to it than that. Weirdly, for a book about a woman, you have to start with the dude, Esther's husband, King Xerxes, after his conquering and soldiering days are over. First, let us clarify. Yes, it is the same King Xerxes from 300. He was the guy who tried to conquer Greece and failed. But his list of victories is pretty extensive. He basically created the very concept of Persia after he became the ruler of Babylonia, Egypt, and a bunch of other nations with their cultures. He also popularized Zoroastrianism, a religion which is considered the predecessor to a lot of monotheistic faiths that have messiah figures and contend with the balance between good and evil. Esther's predecessor, Queen Vashti, was a queen because she disobeyed King Xerxes. But the context puts things in perspective. King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to come to his feast. He wanted her to parade around so he could show off what a beautiful woman his wife was to his bros. This command came while she was hosting her own dinner, and some scholars think he was actually asking her to show up nude. She refused to come, probably because she didn't want to indulge her drunken husband, so obviously the king said she deserved to be punished for such a transgression. Though Vashti was once vilified, modern biblical scholars view her as a feminist icon, standing up for her own right and status as a person. Queen Esther's birth name was Hadassah, a Hebrew name that means myrtle, a beautiful type of tree, but she took on the name Esther to help hide her heritage. This was probably for her own protection, seeing as the anti-Semitic Haman was in power and her cousin Mordecai could see the way the wind was blowing. Esther's greatly admired by how much she tried to maintain her Jewish traditions even in secret. Esther and Mordecai were definitely cousins. There was also a big age gap between them, seeing as Mordecai took Esther in after she was orphaned. But according to the Torah.com, some translations suggest he took her in as his wife, not as his ward. It may not have been as icky as it sounds to modern ears though. Some scholars suggest Mordecai could have married Esther to protect her. The society at hand largely viewed women as the property of men, so marriage meant men wouldn't mess with Esther because to do so was to offend Mordecai. 
Esther wasn't just the king's wife. She was a political powerhouse in her own right. To save her people, she began with a risky first move, entering the king's court without being summoned. This could have 100% gotten Esther killed, but she dared to do it, dressed in the finery of a queen and accompanied by two maids to give her the proper air of authority and power. She then requested the king and Haman both attend a banquet, where she then dramatically revealed her heritage as well as Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews and begs for the king's help. It was a masterful bit of political theatre, but it was only part of the plan. In the background, Mordecai had also foiled a plot to kill the king. Once the king put two and two together, it culminated in a very bad day for Haman. The Jews were saved, Mordecai became the king's chief advisor, and Haman was executed. The Megillah, which is the Jewish text about Esther's life that's read at Purim, says that she may not have had natural beauty, but instead was blessed with grace from God. And honestly, Esther's story makes more sense when her beauty is a God-given superpower. The Jewish Encyclopedia states that in this version of events, the other girls, instead of being jealous, take care of her because they can clearly see the king will choose her. The king tries to look away from her when she visits court to resist her beauty, but God allegedly sends angels to force him to check her out. Later on, he says he will give Esther half the kingdom if she so asked. And when Haman is begging Queen Esther for his life, he falls onto the couch she's lying on. The king walks in, thinks Haman is trying to go after his hot wife, and promptly has Haman executed. For millennia, Esther's story has been celebrated during the holiday of Purim. But modern scholars believe that Purim might not originally have been a Jewish holiday at all. The theory that Purim and the story of Esther are a reworking of a Babylonian holiday, something suggested by the names. Esther, Mordecai and Haman are close to the names of the Babylonian gods Ishtar, Marduk and Haman. The holiday also didn't include religious elements initially. The reading of Esther's story in temple was added over time, and some Jews maintained the tradition of dressing up Halloween style on Purim, which may pay tribute to Jews secretly practicing their religion in times of persecution. It may have also been a way to lend dignity to poor people who were looking for help on Purim. When everyone receives gifts, no one's embarrassed. Esther's story is infamous among Bible scholars for never directly mentioning God. A lot of Sunday school pastors write this off, saying God doesn't have to be mentioned for evidence to show religious forces are at work in Esther's life. But the lack of mentioning of God was actually a big problem when it came to getting Esther into the Bible at all. Religious icon Martin Luther actually said about it, I am so great an enemy to Esther that I wish it had not come to us at all, for it has too many heathen unnaturalities. Interestingly, though, the Greek version of the book of Esther does include dozens of references to God, but those parts are considered to be apocryphal, so they're not included in the Bible. Weird, right? What do we really know about the Holy Grail? Does the Holy Grail come from the Bible or from Arthurian legend? Is it even a cup? Is it even real? If it is, where is it? Here's the truth about the Grail, as far as we know. You probably know the basic story surrounding the Holy Grail. It was the cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper. Later, one of his followers, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, used the cup to catch Jesus' actual blood from the cross, ensuring it became a relic of unimaginable holy power. Joseph then went to England for some reason, taking the Holy Cup with him, where it would become the source of much chivalric desire. If you're only passingly familiar with the Gospels, there's a chance you might assume some or even all of that is in the Bible. In fact, the Gospels merely mention there was a cup Jesus used at the Last Supper with no special attention drawn to it, and there's certainly no mention of Joseph catching Christ's blood in it at the crucifixion. In fact, the only information we have about Joseph of Arimathea is that he was a member of the Jewish High Council and a devoted follower of Jesus who offered his own tomb as a burial place for his savior after the crucifixion. Pretty much everything else about the Holy Grail first pops up in the Middle Ages. 
The first appearance of the Grail comes in the 12th century poem Percival, the story of the Grail, written by Chrétien de Troyes. The relevant portion of the poem features our hero Percival inside the magical home of the Fisher King, where he witnesses a spectacular event, a parade of holy relics, and at the end, a maiden brings in a grail made of gold and studded with jewels. That fancy glowing cup turns out to hold a single communion wafer, which is the miraculous sustenance for the Fisher King's father, the only thing he's eaten for 12 years. Notably, the grail in the story is called a grail and not the grail, and it's definitely never called the Holy Grail or related to the Last Supper at all. Heck, just to make things even more confusing, the modern idea of the grail as a cup is most likely a misconception that evolved after a few mistranslations of ancient Greek and Latin words. In its oldest form, it wasn't a cup but a bowl or serving tray. Really. The grail actually looks like this, which means a holy grail looks like this. Oh. <laughs> One of the writers who picked up the threads from Chrétien's unfinished poem was Robert de Baron, who wrote a work based on the legend of Joseph of Arimathea. This verse romance retells the story of the last days of Jesus, adding in some additional details from popular belief, including the bit about Joseph using the cup from the Last Supper to catch Christ's blood as he was moving his body into the tomb. When Jesus' body disappeared, Joseph was arrested under suspicion of stealing it, and he remained in prison for many years. Fortunately, Jesus appeared to him and gave him the Holy Grail, which sustained him until he was released by the Emperor Vespasian. After this, Joseph and his family found a new home in the West, where he established a line of Holy Grail protectors, which eventually included Percival. Don't bother looking for the Grail, though because it's already been found, according to Arthurian legend, that is. And while Lancelot might be the most famous knight, he definitely wasn't the one to find it. It was his son, Galahad, who was deemed so pure he was allowed to find the Holy Grail and then ascend to heaven. This familiar version of the story, and indeed the very character of Galahad, was added to the Arthurian mythos in a cycle of prose romances from 13th century France known as the Vulgate Cycle. The version of the story of the Holy Grail downplays the role of Percival in order to highlight Galahad, the chosen one who is the only one able to sit in the Siege Perilous, the chair at the round table reserved for the knight destined to find the Grail. Anyone else who dared sit there without being worthy would die. And it's here the Holy Grail becomes the symbol of divine grace only attainable by the purest of pure. Oh, hello. Quick! What? Quick! Why? You're in great peril! Oh, no, what? Is it? Silence, foul tempters! And then there's the Da Vinci Code style idea of the Grail as a person instead of an object. This isn't a new idea, though. It stretches back as far as the 15th century, when English writer John Harding first wondered if Sangrail, the old French term for Holy Grail, wasn't Sangrail, but Sangreal. If that was the case, it would mean royal blood. From this completely fake etymology, a whole cottage industry has sprung up around the idea that rather than a blessed relic from the Last Supper, the Holy Grail is in fact the secret bloodline of Jesus with his secret wife, Mary Magdalene. It was the premise behind the early 80s bestseller Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and perhaps more famously of the early 2000s cultural phenomenon that ripped it off, Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Various writers have also embroiled the Knights Templar in conspiracy theories surrounding the Grail, even though there is no historical evidence linking them to any non-fictional Grail quest. Further complications to the story involve Gnostic Christian movements like the Cathars, and those tales are heavily reliant upon the existence of the secret society of the Priory of Sion which was a complete hoax, made up in the 1950s and 60s by a Frenchman named Pierre Plantard. So, the most realistic modern interpretation of the Grail legend? That's right. <coughs> who are you? We are the knights who say... <coughs> but hey, who knows what's really out there? We're not here to rain on anyone's parade, not completely at least. It's technically possible that the Holy Grail is still out there. According to the earliest tales, Joseph of Arimathea delivered the Grail to the Valleys of Avalon, a location which, since the 12th century, has been associated with Glastonbury in Somerset, England. Legend even states that the first of the famous Glastonbury thorn trees sprung up from a spot where Joseph thrust his staff into the ground. Allegedly, Joseph's grave can be found in Glastonbury as well, so it seems like a logical spot to begin your personal quest. 
The association of the Cathars with the Grail conspiracy theories has led people since the early 20th century to believe that the Grail can be found at the Cathar Castle known as the Chateau de Montségur, which is believed to be the Grail Castle from a 13th century knight poet's version of Parzival. Among those convinced this was the Grail Castle was Heinrich Himmler, who really did send the Nazis in, hoping they could win the war with Jesus' magic cup. Needless to say, they didn't find it. Maybe Galahad or Percival got there first. Science, religion, they're always at odds, right? Nope. Did you know the Bible seems to accurately portray the brightness of stars and that there's some evidence of the Great Flood? Keep watching. Two chapters of Genesis tell the story of Adam and Eve, a specific take on the origin of man that almost everyone is familiar with. Fruit tree in the middle of a garden with a don't touch sign. I mean, why not put it on the top of a high mountain? Or on the moon? And while it's understandably challenging to imagine a person being formed out of another person's rib, science says it's likely that all of Homo sapiens really did have a common ancestor, a so-called mitochondrial Eve. Homo sapiens may have originated in Africa approximately 300,000 years ago, a period of time during which the world's climate was undergoing some drastic changes. The shared ancestor of all modern humans may have been the Homo erectus female who lived at some point between 500,000 years and 50,000 years ago. This theory is supported by the fact that Africa has more genetic diversity than every other region on Earth combined. Meanwhile, Leviticus 17.11 mentions that the life of a creature is found in its blood. Interestingly enough, you could consider a literal interpretation of this idea to be scientifically accurate. For one thing, blood travels around the body and supplies oxygen, nutrients, and other vital elements that are crucial for survival. But it also protects the body via infection-fighting agents, prevents blood loss through clotting, and regulates body temperature. The Bible wasn't wrong when it suggested that blood gives us life. Ancient ideas about water's relationship with the planet can be traced from as early as 1000 BC, when the Greek poet Homer depicted Earth as, quote, floating on a primal ocean. Of course, man's understanding of the water cycle has greatly improved since then. Nowadays, scientists understand that Earth's hydrologic cycle involves water's never-ending movement and state changes across, above, and even within the planet. The hydrologic cycle theory is typically thought to have been discovered by Bernard Palissy, a hydraulics engineer who, in 1580, suggested that it was possible to maintain a river with just rain. His theories would be tested nearly 100 years later, but they only gained traction among scientific thinkers in the early 1900s. If you interpret a few passages from the Bible in a certain way, you'll find some alignment with how modern science understands evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. For instance, Ecclesiastes 1.7 describes how water flowing from streams into the sea eventually returns to its point of origin. Meanwhile, both Amos 9.6 and Job 36.27 and 28 reference water rising from larger bodies of water, such as seas or streams, and then falling back to earth as rain. As the Bible wasn't written with scientific accuracy in mind, spotting the points of alignment can often require an open mind. Mostly, this means accepting that not every interpretation of the Bible is literal. For example, Isaiah 40.22 talks about the circle of the Earth, which some interpret as a reference to Earth being circular when seen from outer space. There's photographic proof of this, of course. The famous photo Earthrise, which was snapped on December 24, 1968 by Apollo 8's crew, shows Earth as an orb floating in space. But the idea that Earth isn't flat isn't exactly new. Thinkers such as Pythagoras and Eratosthenes were already toying with the idea long before Jesus Christ was born. There are more lines in the Bible supporting scientific truths about the Earth itself. Take Job 28.5, for instance, which mentions how hot the Earth is deep inside. Indeed, temperatures inside the Earth can rival the degree of heat on the Sun's surface. Another noteworthy example is found in Job 26.7. Here, the chapter's writer discusses how the Earth is simply floating in space, unsupported by any fixed physical structure whatsoever. Obviously, there's no way the Bible's authors could have known about all this for certain, but it's still remarkable how well this particular dogma has aged. Judging from what today's scientists know about the stars, Jeremiah 33.22 had the right idea when it suggested that the stars in the sky were countless. As it turns out, there could be up to a trillion stars in a single galaxy. That's just a rough estimate, though, based on the evidence that astronomers, astrophysicists, and other space scientists have to work with. Applying some good old-fashioned math makes the picture even clearer. Across the universe's 100 billion galaxies, there could be approximately 10 billion trillion stars. Meanwhile, a literal interpretation of 1 Corinthians 15.41 would reveal an impressive level of cohesion with modern astronomy in terms of stars' brightness or magnitude. 
This Bible verse talks about the different splendors of the sun, the moon, and all the other stars in the universe. Specifically, Corinthians says, star differs from star in glory. In fact, there's a clear scientific reason why certain stars look brighter to earthlings than others. Stars vary in brightness from the vantage point of people on Earth, and this depends on factors such as the amount of light energy a star emits or how far it is from the planet. It was the Greek astronomer Hipparchus who first developed a chart of the different degrees of stars' brightness, some 200 years before Corinthians was written. Well, it was nice to meet you, God. Thank you for the Grand Canyon, and good luck with the apocalypse. Oh, and by the way, you suck! The Bible doesn't pull any punches when it comes to the end of the world. The book of Revelation paints a particularly dramatic picture of how it'll all go down, but it's not the only apocalyptic verse in the Holy Book. In fact, at one point, the Bible even mentions how the stars in the sky and other celestial bodies won't last forever, centuries before modern science could support this with evidence. According to Matthew 24, 35, both heaven and earth will eventually pass away. In the context of astronomy, stars reach the end of their lives once they've exhausted all the nuclear fuel that keeps them burning. The bigger the star, the faster it burns through its hydrogen fuel. And when the fuel is completely depleted, the star either collapses into itself or becomes a black hole, depending on its size. A black hole has an incredibly strong gravitational field due to the star's mass. It's so strong that not even light can escape its pull. For a long time, however, the existence of black holes couldn't be proven with direct evidence. The first ever photograph of one was taken on April 10, 2019, a historic endeavor that required 200 scientists and eight super powerful telescopes located across five continents. According to Hebrews 11.3, God didn't make the universe out of what was visible. One way to interpret this is that the building blocks of the universe are imperceptible to the naked human eye. And of course, physics supports this notion too. Atoms make up pretty much everything that human senses can perceive. Identical atoms, when bound together, form the chemical elements, which are the simplest forms of substances obtainable through ordinary chemical processes. Atoms are so small that if you were to take 100 million atoms of hydrogen and line them up, they would not exceed a centimeter in length, and they're made up of even smaller particles. It would take a thousand protons or neutrons to match the diameter of a single atom of hydrogen. Protons and neutrons, in turn, are a thousand times bigger than electrons and quarks. Does your head hurt yet? One of the most well-known stories from the Bible is the tale of the world-engulfing Great Flood in Noah's Ark. This story is spread out across three chapters of Genesis, detailing how one man and his family successfully constructed an ark and saved all the animals of the planet from a massive flood. Interestingly, there are various kinds of sedimentary rocks across the planet with different chemical compositions, serving as geological evidence that at some point in Earth's history, huge floods could have actually occurred. However, it's highly unlikely that water engulfed the Earth's entirety in a single flood, as the flood story suggests. This is because it's not possible for the rock deposits to have formed simultaneously, going by fossil evidence and basic scientific knowledge. It's possible, however, that the Great Flood was a regional flood that looked apocalyptic to everyone affected by it. And then there's the Ark. At first glance, it may seem impossible for such a vessel to properly accommodate 35,000 different animal species and float. In 2014, however, students from the University of Leicester crunched the numbers and learned that such an Ark could indeed float. Whether all the animals could actually fit in there, however, is an entirely different question. The way it was told in 1 Samuel 17, it might be difficult to picture how David, a small boy with a slingshot, took out the battle-hardened brute Goliath. However, if one theory about Goliath were true, then David's victory was a likely outcome, if not a foregone conclusion. Many people mistakenly think that David's slingshot was little more than a child's toy. While a slingshot may not sound as impressive as, say, a sword or a pike, it could be an absolute killer in the right hands. And David was working with arguably the best bullets available. The stones from the Elah Valley were made of barium sulfate, which were twice as dense as ordinary stones. In other words, David's slingshot was a 35 meter per second death dealer, hitting his gigantic foe with the awesome power of a 45 caliber pistol. That's just half of it, though. Goliath may have looked imposing, but the way he was described in the chapter suggests that his gigantic frame may have come at a terrible cost to his health. The author Malcolm Gladwell has theorized that Goliath actually suffered from acromegaly, an overproduction of growth hormones due to a tumor on the pituitary gland. This would also mean that Goliath likely had poor eyesight. Acromegaly can cause a person to lose their peripheral vision, limiting what they can see to what's in front of them. In the end, Goliath probably didn't stand a chance. Numerous creation myths from various cultures assert that the mountains of Earth were manually crafted by deities. 
That's why it's a bit strange that the story of creation in the book of Genesis doesn't directly mention God shaping the mountains by hand. As it turns out, this small omission could be interpreted as having some slight bearing in real-life science. At least two passages from the book of Psalms talk about underwater mountains. If these texts are interpreted literally, they may actually be referring to sea mounts. These are mountains formed from powerful volcanic activity underneath the ocean. Just like terrestrial mountains, sea mounts become rich grounds for biodiversity to flourish due to the fact that they help bring nutrients from the seafloor to the flora and fauna that live near the water's edge. It has been estimated that there are approximately 30,000 sea mounts under the ocean. Joshua 10.12 attributes a key biblical victory to the fact that God supposedly made the sun stand still. Two men of physics saw this as an opportunity to shed light on what could have been a remarkable astronomical phenomenon, and the only tools at their disposal were words and math. In a paper published in 2017, Sir Colin Humphreys and his partner, W. Graham Waddington, discussed how this game-changing event could have actually been a solar eclipse. They started by speaking to a Semitic languages professor to determine if the account, originally written in Hebrew, could be interpreted as an eclipse. After learning that it was possibly an annular eclipse, they cross-referenced it to another source, the ancient Egyptian-made Merneptah steel, to strengthen their hypothesis. Not content with what they'd unearthed, the two scientists even went so far as to calculate the exact date it happened. By performing some fancy arithmetic, Humphreys and Waddington were able to pinpoint a date for the day God stopped the sun, October 30th, 1207 BC. These days, St. Peter is mostly known as a guy who has a basilica in Rome and a burg in Russia, but St. Peter was actually one of the most important people in the New Testament. Here's a bunch of stuff you probably never knew about him. The story of Peter first meeting Jesus varies a little from one gospel to the other, but basically, Peter is fishing with his brother Andrew. Jesus tells them to drop their nets and come with him because he's going to have them fish for people instead. And Peter does, just like that. But the Bible and modern archaeology tell us a lot about what he was leaving behind. Many Christians have an idea that the disciples were poor before they started wandering around with Jesus. But Peter, at least, was probably doing pretty well for himself. From the various Gospels, we learn he had at least three employees, his own boat, and a house big enough to accommodate some extended family. We also know that he was from the city of Bethsaida, and archaeologists believe they found it. Ancient Bethsaida appears to have been a thriving urban settlement with elements of posh Roman culture, extremely significant in a place that was then generally a backwater of the empire. So, Peter? He wasn't just following Jesus in the hopes of finding something better, he already had it pretty good. When it comes to the disciples, Peter is unquestionably the most important, as all four gospel writers give him the most coverage by far. Across all of the New Testament, Peter is mentioned by name over 200 times, while the next most talked about disciple is John, who gets a mere 29 name drops. More than that, the gospels agree that he served as sort of a spokesman for the group, and he enjoyed as much of a position of authority as any of the disciples had. He's even chosen to be the first male follower who witnessed the resurrection, although Mary Magdalene got the real honor. And Jesus even selects him to be the one to build the church after he goes to heaven. That's extra strange since the Gospels paint Peter as an argumentative screw-up. Peter is always asking Jesus questions and arguing with him, and he doesn't always have unwavering faith in his Messiah. Still, Jesus gives him the benefit of the doubt, and that says a lot about forgiveness and faith. After the Last Supper, the group goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and they're met by Judas Iscariot and some armed guards. But one of the disciples, identified as Peter in John 18.10, wasn't going down without a fight, and whipped out a sword to cut off the ear of some random unarmed servant. Unlike many gospel stories, it's included in all four books, with just a few different details. Even the basics make no sense. Jesus was very specific that his disciples shouldn't carry anything of value with them, not even an extra tunic or sandals. But suddenly one of them has a sword? Not to mention that Peter was a fisherman by trade, not the kind of person you'd expect to know how to use a sword at all. And swinging it at someone's head and causing some serious bodily harm was definitely illegal, yet Peter doesn't get arrested or killed on the spot? Add in the fact that when the books were written, early Christians were trying to promote themselves as non-violent revolutionaries. So, if the scene didn't happen, why make the story up? And if it did happen, why did every gospel writer include it if Peter made them look bad? Here's a strange little tale. Acts introduces readers to a guy named Simon Magus, who sees the disciples performing great feats and miracles and offers to pay them to give him the same powers. Peter shuts him down, tells him to repent, 
And that's all we hear about Simon Magus in the New Testament. But the apocryphal books that didn't get included in the Bible have a lot more to say about this magician. Simon supposedly arrived in Rome by flying in on a cloud of smoke, performed miracles throughout the city, and started calling himself the great power of God. Simon and Peter decide the only way to settle their differences is with a good old-fashioned miracle contest in public. Peter goes all out, raising people from the dead and exposing Simon as a fraud. To save face, Simon declares he's going to jump off the Roman Forum in front of the Emperor Nero, no less, to prove that he can fly. But Peter prays for Simon to crash, and he does, causing an injury that later kills him. But Simon got his time when a sect that believed he was God arose in the 2nd century. The Bible doesn't actually tell us what happened to Peter after he went off to preach. The only thing to go on is a very metaphorical statement Jesus makes in John that says, quote, when you grow older, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. This is supposed to show that Peter, too, will be crucified, even if it's extremely vague and symbolic. But non-biblical early church sources are unanimous in the reports that Peter was crucified, most likely in Rome. While the exact year is harder to pin down, it's generally accepted that Peter was caught up in Nero's crackdown on the budding Christian religion starting in 64 AD. But the oft-repeated story that he was crucified upside down at his own request because he didn't think he was good enough to die in the same way as Jesus is harder to substantiate. Very few sources mention this detail, and while there is evidence Roman executioners sometimes mixed up the whole crucifixion process just for their own entertainment, why would they do what a condemned prisoner asked them to? Peter is considered a key guy in many religions, from Protestantism to Islam, but the Catholics took his importance a major step further. They interpret a passage in Matthew to show that Peter wasn't just an important apostle, he was the guy who was going to be in complete charge after Jesus was gone. From just a few simple sentences grew a huge, complex organization with one guy at the head, the Pope. Peter was followed by other popes after his death, and the line is considered unbroken to this day, minus some anti-pope drama here and there. Tradition not only says Peter was crucified in Rome, it is extremely specific about where he was supposedly buried. According to the University of Alberta, the current St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City is built on another church from the 300s, which was built on top of a necropolis, alleged to contain the remains of St. Peter. This was all completely theoretical for almost 2,000 years. Then, in 1939, archaeologists got permission to do some digging. In a niche by the high altar, they found some bones, and when they were analyzed, the tests showed they were from a guy of the right age from the right time period. They also showed evidence of the remains of purple vestments. The BBC says the cherry on the cake was the ancient inscription next to the bones reading Petros Imi, or Peter is within. Pope Francis unveiled the bones for the first time in 2013. That didn't stop another church from stepping forward in 2017 to claim that they had the real remains of St. Peter. So one thing seems sure, we'll never really know. Everyone thinks they know how the Bible goes. As it turns out, though, there might be more to the sacred text than anyone realizes. Want to know how time travel factors into God's plan or which biblical villain might actually be a hero? Keep watching to find out. The Bible is split into two main sections, the Old Testament, which also constitutes the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament, which compiles the teachings of Jesus and serves as the foundation of the Christian religion. The Bible is also a collection of stories, songs, poems, letters, and apparent historical accounts. Basically, it's all over the place, and while many of the people and events discussed in the Bible can be verified by examining surviving documents and monuments, others can't. Some figures have long been mysterious, albeit backed up by more recent research. For example, until 1961, there was no historical evidence that Pontius Pilate actually existed. Some people believe there's insufficient evidence to support the idea that even Jesus Christ existed. The so-called Jesus myth theory suggests that Christ was invented along with most of the events in the New Testament. The earliest sources that refer to Jesus of Nazareth were written decades after the alleged events of the Bible took place, and these writings failed to provide any detailed evidence to support their versions of events. The Jesus myth theory argues instead that the Bible was written as a way to manipulate and control people, which would certainly change everything for the billions of people who have placed their faith in it. There can be little doubt that the Bible is kind of a confusing book. The good book was composed over the course of thousands of years in several languages, using different styles and forms, and codified via committees with their own competing agendas. The Bible may have had one editor, though, God, 
The theory that everything in the Bible was specifically dictated by God using his mysterious ways is an old one, and some scholars believe that God literally dictated the Torah to Moses letter by letter. This has given rise to various theories that the text of the Bible isn't just a symbolic compendium of God's laws and teachings, but also an incredibly complex code. Whoa. An 18th century rabbi named Elijah of Vilna argued that all of creation is encoded in the first five books of the Torah, including everyone who will ever live and the details of their lives. Scientists have even used a technique called equidistant letter sequence to spot strange language patterns in the Bible, which seem to reveal coded messages. Then again, this technique also yields hidden coded messages in Moby Dick and War and Peace. So unless God also dictated his will to Leo Tolstoy, it's probably fair to say the jury's out on this one. Most of us are familiar with the concept of reincarnation. This is the idea that when you die, you are reborn into a new life, usually without any memory of your previous existences. Many major religions, including Buddhism and Hinduism, hold reincarnation as one of their core tenets, but not Christianity. In the Christian church, you are given only one life. After that, you pass into the afterlife where you are judged and sent either to heaven, hell, or possibly purgatory. You're never reborn again. However, there is a theory that the earliest teachings of the Christian church did indeed include reincarnation. According to some, these teachings were removed when the church began organizing the text that would later become the official Bible. Unfortunately, reincarnation was seen to undermine the spiritual system of judgment that the church taught, and so any reference to it was removed from the Bible entirely. However, many early Christians openly believed in reincarnation, and the Gnostic Christians specifically included it in their teachings. Mary Magdalene is one of the most fascinating characters in the Bible. For thousands of years, the popular image of Magdalene was that of a former sex worker, a supposed fallen woman who found salvation through faith in Jesus. Let him among you who is without sin cast the first stone. But in 1969, the Catholic Church admitted that this interpretation wasn't actually supported by the text of the Bible. In fact, many believe that the Bible explicitly supports the idea that Magdalene wasn't just a female follower of Jesus, but his most important follower, that she was, in fact, an apostle. The theory argues that Magdalene's status threatened the patriarchal structure of the church, reworking her public image into a wretched sex worker whose sole connection to Jesus lay in his mercy towards her, underscored the idea that women and the sexual temptation they represented were to be controlled and oppressed. In fact, Magdalene's stature in the Bible has often been used to justify calls for women to be admitted to the priesthood. These calls were amplified when the church later admitted Magdalene had probably not been a sex worker at all. If the theory that Magdalene was an apostle gains further ground, it could change everything for the greater Christian church. If you've ever read Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, or seen the movie adaptation, then you probably already know how this one goes. Who is she? My dear, that's Mary Magdalene. In this story, the terrible secret covered up by the Catholic Church is that Mary Magdalene wasn't simply a follower of Jesus. Rather, she was his wife, and after his death, she fled to what is now modern in France and gave birth to his daughter. As it turns out, there are plenty of people who think that this might not be fiction. Indeed, there's a large gap of time in Jesus' life that we know almost nothing about, from when he was about eight days old until he was in his early 30s. There's just one mention of Jesus during this time, as the Bible mentions that he traveled with his parents to Jerusalem when he would have been about 12. But an ancient document known as the Lost Gospel allegedly fills in some of Jesus' story. It tells us that he married Mary Magdalene and had two children with her. It's not the only reference to Jesus being married, either. An ancient Egyptian scroll known as the Gospel of Jesus' Wife also alludes to his mysterious wife. The book of Revelation is one of the strangest parts of the Bible. It's written in a style completely different from the rest of the book. It's filled with horrifying imagery, and it follows a strange dreamlike logic. This has led to a wide variety of interpretations, with some arguing it's a coded description of events that were current at the time or events much further in the past. The most popular interpretation, however, is that the book of Revelation is about the apocalypse. That places the events of Revelation firmly in the future, which is where most people like their end-of-the-world scenarios to remain. But some believe in a theory that the events described in Revelation aren't in the past or the future. Instead, they're unfolding all around us, and they have been for centuries. The historicist view of Revelation states that the events described in this book won't happen all at once, but over the course of a very long time, as part of a process that began long, long ago. And if they're right, well, who knows what might happen next. There's one golden rule about any historical mystery. Eventually, someone, somewhere, will speculate that it's all about aliens. 
From the pyramids of Giza to the lost city of Atlantis, there's always someone who writes a lengthy treatise insisting that E.T. was behind it all. E.T. Home phone. And the Bible is no exception. The prevalent theory goes that the Bible is actually about a race of super advanced aliens, and Jesus was actually an alien-human hybrid. Bizarrely, plenty of biblical details apparently lend themselves to this theory. The star of Bethlehem can be seen as the arrival of a spaceship. The missing decades of Jesus' life were a period in which the aliens taught Christ what he needed to know to control humanity, and his resurrection and rise into heaven was him being beamed back to the mothership. You can even read the prophet Ezekiel's description of angels flying in a chariot made of wheels within wheels as clear evidence of a vehicle piloted by aliens. In fact, some people actually regard this as the earliest recorded UFO sighting. The name Judas has evolved into a handy byword for treachery. Even non-Christians know that Judas sold Jesus to the Romans in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. But there's one theory that claims Judas wasn't a traitor or a villain. On the contrary, he was a hero who sacrificed himself to ensure Jesus could return to heaven. In this reading of the story, Judas was acting under Jesus' instructions, and his soul was the one sacrificed in order to save the world. This theory is rooted in the apocryphal Gospel of Judas, an ancient text excluded from the Bible that shines a much different light on Judas' story. The nature of Judas's heroism is tied up in the complex beliefs of a Christian sect known as the Gnostics. That's also why the text was excluded in the first place, because the Gnostics were suppressed by the mainstream church. But the Gospel of Judas suggests that Jesus knew of Judas's betrayal and allowed it to happen. The Bible is actually somewhat ambiguous concerning Judas' status as a traitor. Jesus speaks warmly of him even in the midst of his betrayal, and the other apostles aren't exactly heroic either, abandoning Jesus at the crucial moment of his arrest. As with so many other elements of the Bible, the strength of Judas' character is very much open to interpretation. Some pretty incredible stuff happens in the Bible. You've got angels, resurrections, and burning bushes that speak to people. So it probably won't come as a surprise to hear that there is a theory that the Bible pretty much explicitly describes time travel, too. Great Scott. Ah! This theory pivots off of a story involving the prophet Jeremiah. One day, Jeremiah is sitting with some friends and tells a young boy named Abimelech to go fetch some figs. So the kid goes to a nearby hill and promptly blacks out. When he wakes up, he's still a kid, but 62 years have somehow passed. It's worth pointing out that this particular story is apocryphal, meaning you won't find it in the Bible as it's considered spurious by most modern Christian churches. Of course, a key factor in the time travel theory is the idea that God exists outside of time, as well as the notion that God can do anything he likes, including manipulating time when it suits him. The tale of Cain and Abel is one of the best known stories in the Bible. The sons of Adam and Eve, Cain becomes jealous of Abel when God takes Abel's sacrifice in preference to Cain's. Enraged, Cain kills his brother, so God marks him and exiles him. The term Mark of Cain comes from the story, generally used to convey shame and guilt. The theory that has grown around this mark stems from the fact that nowhere in the Bible is the mark actually identified or explained. Unfortunately, this has led some people to concoct some pretty horrendous theories of their own. For example, the Mormon church at one point believed that the mark was dark skin, which provided an argument for refusing non-white people into their priesthood, while also conveniently excusing their own racist beliefs. The Church of Latter-day Saints admits that this was once the case. Brigham Young put the restriction in place in 1852, citing the mark of Cain as one reason. Then again, Young also believed that the curse would someday be lifted and non-white people would eventually be afforded full privileges in the Mormon church, which officially occurred in 1978. Let's be honest, though, that doesn't make this any less of a messed up theory. The Bible is known as the greatest story ever told, but plenty of its smaller subplots don't really hold up to narrative scrutiny. There are lots of threads in the Bible, and some of them are never really explained. Here are some huge Bible stories that were never finished. Early in Genesis, we get one of the Bible's all-time hits, the story of Cain murdering his brother Abel in a jealous rage. Genesis 4, 16-17 ends with God sending Cain to live in the land of Nod. Sounds straightforward, until you realize the Bible fails to mention where or what this mysterious place is. And Nod may not even be real, but rather metaphorical. Nod comes from a word that means wandering or exile, so some scholars suggest it's just a fancy way of saying Cain had to leave his people. Or maybe they just miswrote Zod. Oh God. Zod. On the other hand, a lot of locations in the Old Testament are real places, so maybe Nod is too. Everywhere from the Caucasus to China have been suggested as possible locations, and there's even a hamlet in England that calls itself the Land of Nod. 
But for now, nobody knows where the true knot is, and we probably never will. Have you ever watched the series that goes out of its way to introduce an insanely powerful character whose mere existence changes everything, only for that character to be immediately written out? Unless you're a fan of Lost, the answer is probably no. No one writes the groundwork for, say, Thanos, ominously introduces him at the end of Avengers, and then just pretends he doesn't exist anymore. Nobody except the writers of the Bible, that is. The Bible just loves pulling stuff like that. Just check out Melchizedek, an immortal priest who appears out of nowhere and then vanishes again. The clearest reference to the unkillable priest, which sounds like the plot of John Wick 4, comes in Hebrews 7. There, the author describes Melchizedek as a guy, quote, without father or mother, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God. The eternal proto-Jesus, who was so important that Abraham paid tithes to him, is also mentioned in Psalm 110, which vaguely alludes to Melchizedek being a prototype for a future messiah. The messiah turned out to be Jesus, so it's entirely possible Melchizedek is God's first attempt at making mankind savior. That would seem like a pretty big deal, which makes it even weirder that he's never mentioned again. Of all the merely hinted at backstories in the Bible, the history of the Nephilim has to be the most tantalizing. Genesis 6 says they were created by the union of sons of God and daughters of humans, with the King James Version flat out calling them giants. But before we can learn much about them, God goes and destroys the entire earth in an apocalyptic flood, and everything not on Noah's Ark drowns. But wait, like a Doctor Who cliffhanger giving us the merest glimpse of a Dalek to keep us coming back next week, the fourth book of the Bible then drops in a gasp-inducing passage. Numbers 13, 32-33 includes a report on a nearby land some of the Israelites visit, where the Nephilim still roam and are now so big that the Israelites look like grasshoppers to them. If you're hoping for Attack on Titan Bible Edition, though, prepare to be disappointed. After that, the Nephilim just vanish. We hear about something vaguely Nephilim-like in Deuteronomy 3, where the defeated King Og is said to sleep in a bed that is 13 and a half feet long. But Og is apparently a Rephate, a different race of giants the Bible tells us exists then also never bothers to fill us in on. Come on, guys, stop leaving us hanging. Witches have generally been frowned upon by the church because, you know, they get their wicked powers from the devil and all that sort of stuff. So how do you explain the time the king of Israel visited a witch and she totally summoned the dead spirit of a great Hebrew prophet? It happened in 1 Samuel 28. Right after the prophet Samuel dies, King Saul prays for guidance. Nothing happens, so he does the obvious thing. He consults the Ewoks. I do believe they think I am some sort of god. <laughs> Okay, no, but he does consult a woman known as the Witch of Endor. She summons the ghost of Samuel, who promptly chastises Saul for straying from God, and predicts he and his sons will die in battle the very next day. Spoiler alert, he's right. This is also a major plot twist. Up there with discovering the island in Lost can travel through time. Apparently, there actually are good witches, like Sabrina. But despite this amazing twist, the rest of the Bible still dumps all over witches, leading to centuries of persecution. Doesn't seem fair, does it? The Book of Job is an odd book, as it features God in the role of the villain, like a wrestler who just turned heel. And like a pro wrestler, it even features a section in Job 40, 14-24, where God just straight up brags about how awesome he is. But rather than bagging WWE titles and clobbering Stone Cold Steve Austin, God's biggest brag turns out to be creating something called Behemoth. Behemoth is some kind of big monster. God goes into epic details about its cedar-like tail and iron-like limbs which are apparently so strong it can withstand a rushing river. He then follows this up in Job 41 with a similar brag about Leviathan, a gigantic sea monster that is apparently also a fire-breathing dragon. While most people these days know Behemoth and Leviathan as monsters from the Final Fantasy series, some Christians think the verses prove that God created the dinosaurs. You did. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. You'd think a couple of dinosaurs running around the Old Testament might be something that people would mention from time to time. Where art Ezekiel? Eaten by velociraptors, my lord. But no, Behemoth appears and then disappears again in a single monologue. And maybe that's just as well. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. The rapture is the notion that one day, Jesus Christ will return to Earth, and all faithful Christians, living and dead, will rise to meet him in the sky before being welcomed into heaven. Are you an angel? <laughs> yes, sir. That's so cool! Congratulations, dude! Ah, oh, fellas! Yeah! Yes. Oh! Dude, you 
that one! It's a pervasive concept in the modern understanding of Christianity, spread largely through television evangelists, various religious tracts, and even pop culture. But what exactly does the Bible itself have to say about the rapture? Well, the short answer is nothing. In fact, the word rapture doesn't actually appear anywhere in the New Testament. That's not to say that no similar word is used to explain such a concept. However, the Apostle Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians says, We will be caught up together with them in the clouds. In the Latin translation of the original Greek, this segment contains the word rapamur, another form of the verb that gives us rapture, which means seize or tear away. The current version of the rapture doesn't appear in the Bible, however, but rather arose out of developments in thought during the Great Awakenings of the 18th and 19th centuries. It's also important to understand that the rapture is far from a universally held Christian belief, being prominent primarily among evangelical Protestants. However, just because the Bible doesn't literally say that Jesus will summon the dead into the sky in an event called the rapture, isn't to say there's no scriptural basis for the idea. All four canonical gospels mention a time at which the living and the dead will all be gathered together and judged before being sent to their eternal destiny. But while the resurrection and judgment of the dead is a pretty unambiguous part of the Bible's message, a physical levitation into the sky is less universally accepted. The idea of a physical rapture was popularized in the 1830s by an evangelical British minister following visions of Christ's second coming by a young man from Scotland. This idea spread to American evangelicals in the early 20th century, and the doomsday-minded American media only fanned the flames. The idea of the rapture is far from universally believed either, even among Christians. Part of the reason for this is that one of the murkiest aspects of Christian theology is the study of the end times, otherwise known as eschatology. While most Christians believe that Christ will return to earth, the second coming and the rapture are not always synonymous. The key evolution of the idea is a concept called premillennial dispensationalism. This is based on the idea that God has treated humans differently at different points in history, and that history can be broken up into different eras based on the different stages of God's plan. For example, God seemingly treated the world differently before the flood than after, and things changed big time after he gave the law to Moses. The belief is that the current era of humanity will be followed by a seven-year period of tribulation for non-believers, after which Jesus will come back with the righteous and rule over a thousand-year era of peace known as the millennium. It's also suggested that the rapture will occur before this tribulation, making the rapture and the second coming two separate events. There is also a sect of belief known as post-millennialism, which suggests that we are already in the so-called millennium, as it began at Christ's resurrection. This line of thought suggests that we are slowly moving toward the consummation of God's kingdom, which will end with Christ's second coming. Then there are our millennialists, who believe that the millennium is a metaphor that represents the era of Christ's church. They say it's not a literal thousand years. There's no actual seven-year tribulation, and perhaps, most notably, there'll be no actual rapture at all. This view argues that Christians don't get a get out of tribulation free card to enjoy time with Jesus before the end times. Instead, they have a moral obligation to improve the world in preparation of Christ's return. The truth is though, these are relatively obscure beliefs in the wider Christian dogma. Despite the prevalence of the rapture in popular culture, the vast majority of Christians, from Catholics to Lutherans, and Methodists to Anglicans, don't subscribe to the concept of a bodily rapture. There are some biblical prophecies that arguably did come to pass in ancient times. But did you know that there are prophecies that have predicted the EU RFID chips and the end times, which we may be living in now? Here are some prophecies that ended up coming true. Both Jews and Christians alike consider Isaiah to be the greatest of the Hebrew prophets. He lived in the 8th century BCE and served as the advisor to multiple kings of Judah during the time when the major world power was the Assyrian Empire. Much of the prophecy in the early chapters of the book of Isaiah regards the threat of Assyria, with many of Judah's kings disregarding Isaiah's advice. It wasn't until the reign of Hezekiah that someone in charge actually listens to what Isaiah has to say. So what did Isaiah have to say? Well, around 701 BCE, the Assyrian king Sennacherib laid siege to Judah and captured its cities. A panicked Hezekiah asked Isaiah for advice, and the prophet told him to do nothing because the siege would fail. And this turned out to be right. For unknown reasons, hundreds of thousands of Assyrian soldiers died, and Sennacherib returned home. Interestingly, the later chapters of Isaiah correctly predict the rise of the Babylonian Empire and Judah's fall to it, nearly a century in advance. However, many scholars argue significant portions of his predictions were actually written after the fact. 
By word count, the longest book in the Bible is the book of Jeremiah, which collects the sayings of the so-called weeping prophet. Jeremiah wrote not only the book of prophecy that bears his name, but also the book of Kings, and his ministry began roughly 50 years after the end of Isaiah's. And so Jeremiah's book deals with the threat posed by Assyria's successor on the world stage, Babylon. The very first chapter of Jeremiah describes Babylon as, quote, a boiling pot tilting away from the north. And before long, Jeremiah is warning the people of Judah that Babylon is coming as God's righteous punishment upon his unfaithful people. And he was right. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the capital city of Jerusalem in 597 BCE. He then pillaged the great temple of Solomon and took the king and many prominent citizens back to Babylon as exiles. Jeremiah warned the puppet regent that he would surrender to Babylon, but he revolted, and as punishment, the temple and the whole city of Jerusalem were destroyed in 587 BCE. As with Isaiah, however, it's important to note that many scholars argue that only portions of the book of Jeremiah are by the prophet. Many portions were written later by Jeremiah's scribe Baruch. All these prophecies pile up on one another and build the legends that is Jerusalem. Ezekiel lived during the time of the Babylonian exile that Jeremiah warned against, and portions of Ezekiel's book promise the end of captivity and the restoration of Jerusalem and its temple. The middle chapters of his prophecies, however, contain warnings of destruction against foreign nations. Most notably, Ezekiel's predictions against Egypt and the great city of Tyre show proof of the prophet's accuracy. Ezekiel promises that Tyre will be swept away by enemies and Egypt will be a desolate waste. And as it so happened, Nebuchadnezzar's 13-year war against Tyre drove the Tyrian people off the mainland and onto an island. And then, the Muslim invasion of Egypt in the 7th century CE left Egypt relatively insignificant. Skeptics argue, of course, that these interpretations are a stretch, as neither Tyre nor Egypt were left these smoldering ruins promised by Ezekiel. The Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BCE saw many Israelites banished from their homes and scattered about the Middle East. This scattering of the Jewish people worsened in the age of the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE and reached its final tipping point with the Roman conquest of Jerusalem in 70 CE. The Romans destroyed the Second Temple, crushed the Judean state, and drove the Jewish people from their homes. As a result, a lot of Hebrew prophecy concerns the restoration of Israel and the Jewish people. The latter chapters of Ezekiel promise that Jerusalem and its temple will be rebuilt and the people who'd been scattered will be brought back home. The middle chapters of Jeremiah promise restoration for Israel and Judah. Some would argue that these prophecies were predicting the period after the Babylonian exile and during the second temple period of Judah. However, others argue that these prophecies reference the modern state of Israel, which in turn warns of the approaching end times. For Jews, that would include the Messianic age, and for Christians, that would include the second coming of Christ. Whatever you do or do not believe about the Jewish or Christian Judgment Day, it's certainly true that some prophets say Israel would exist again, and it currently does. The biblical figure of Daniel, the guy from the lion's den, was among the noble citizens of Judah who were taken to Babylon during the exile. His clean living and uncanny ability to interpret dreams guaranteed him a position of power in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. There, he predicted Babylon's doom. Daniel made two famous prophecies. The first was his interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a statue made of various materials. The second was a vision of a ghostly hand writing on the wall at King Balthazar's feast. Both of these prophecies predicted that Babylon would fall to the Persians, which would subsequently fall to the Greeks, who would then be superseded by the Romans. As this was indeed the succession of power in that part of the world, many people take the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy as proof of the accuracy of the Bible. The rebuttal to this is, of course, that most scholars agree that the book of Daniel was actually written centuries after the Babylonian exile, and Daniel's foresights were actually hindsights. Prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are considered the major prophets thanks to their weighty passages of doom against the world's greatest empires. Thankfully, however, the Hebrew Bible is also full of minor prophets whose messages from God are much shorter than their major colleagues. One such minor prophet was Nahum, a contemporary of Isaiah who spent most of his three-chapter book proclaiming the downfall of Assyria, specifically its capital city, Nineveh. You might remember Nineveh as the city the prophet Jonah hated so much that he'd rather be eaten by a big fish than warn them of God's wrath. Or you might recognize it as the historical capital of the real Neo-Assyrian Empire. Either is fine. An interesting thing about Nahum's prophecies against Nineveh is how specific they are. Chapter 1 says that the Ninevites will be drunk like drunkards and consumed like dry straw. And the ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus recorded that the city of Nineveh was attacked by people who took advantage of the fact that the Assyrian soldiers were too drunk to defend the city. 
Likewise, archaeologists found a layer of ash in the ruins of Nineveh, suggesting it was burned as Nahum foresaw. Of course, saying that a city will burn is probably the most generic possible threat ever. A thing one must understand about Christians is that they believe all Hebrew scripture, known as the Old Testament, is actually all about them. That is to say that everything from Genesis to Malachi is leading toward the birth of Jesus, whom they identify as the Son of God and the long-promised Messiah. As such, it's very easy to find examples of Christian interpretation of Hebrew prophecies. For example, Daniel chapter 9 says that the Messiah will come after the restoration of the temple and before it's destroyed for a second time. Well, historical Jesus did live during the second temple period. Genesis 49 claims that the tribe of Judah would retain power until the coming of the Messiah. This is interpreted to mean the Herodian dynasty that was usurped by the Romans in Jesus' lifetime. And Isaiah chapter 1 claims that the Messiah will be a descendant of the royal line of David. Well, the genealogies in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke go to some effort to prove Jesus as descended from David through Solomon. The name Muhammad doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. But since the earliest days, it's been part of Muslim tradition that both Hebrew and Christian scriptures predict the rise of the great prophet of Islam. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, for example, proclaims that God will raise up a prophet from among the people. And Muslim scholars have long interpreted this to mean the people of Ishmael, who was the son of Abraham and who was considered the ancestor of the Arab people. Likewise, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, describes God shining forth from three places, Sinai, Seir, and Mount Paran. The Muslim understanding is that Sinai refers to the advent of Moses, Seir to the rise of Jesus, and Paran is considered to be Mecca, and so points to the coming of Muhammad. Similarly, John chapter 14 claims God sent an advocate which is understood by Christians to be the Holy Spirit that descended on the apostles after Jesus' ascension. Muslims, however, interpreted this to mean a comforter sent by God, namely Muhammad. It was believed that this comforter would clear up the misconceptions brought about by the incomplete teachings of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures and this was to be accomplished through the Quran. The Apocalypse of John, better known as the Book of Revelations, has captivated imaginations for centuries with its terrifying visions of angels, dragons, beasts, and horsemen. Some Christians even interpret the book as a prophecy for the end times. Many have sought evidence of the modern world in John's apocalyptic visions, including signs of modern technology that they can use to prove the end of the world is coming. I think it's a sign from God, but don't quote me on that. Perhaps the most widespread idea of Revelation reflecting the modern world is the mark of the beast. John explains in chapter 13 that this mark is on one's hand or forehead, and without it you can't buy or sell anything. This has been interpreted to mean a kind of barcode or radio frequency identification chip that will be used to enforce control over the people. Similarly, some Christians claim that the reference in chapter 11 to how people of all nations will be able to see dead bodies almost instantly hints at live, globe-spanning communication and the 24-hour news cycle. And of course, a popular detail among conspiracy theorists is that the beast is supposed to arise from a European power even bigger than the Roman Empire, widely interpreted as the European Union. Of course, there's always a counterpoint, and here it's that Revelation is a thinly veiled criticism of the Roman Empire, which had recently destroyed Jerusalem. For some people, the explicit prophecies laid out by the prophets of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures aren't enough. There must be, they say, even more secret predictions contained within a series of hidden patterns in the original biblical text, some kind of Bible code. A book by Michael Drosnin called The Bible Code made a splash in 1997 with its claim that manuscripts of the first five books of the Bible contain references to specific modern events. The way this code works is by using what's known as, quote, equidistant letter sequences. That is, looking at every second, fifth, tenth, hundredth, and so on letter and seeing what it spells. That way you can find hidden meaning in the Hebrew manuscripts. Using this method, Drosden claimed that the Bible predicts John F. Kennedy's assassination in Dallas, the use of Scud missiles in the Gulf War, and the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Drosden went on to explain that the Bible was actually written by the aliens who brought human DNA to Earth and who left the key to understanding the code hidden in its steel obelisk near the Dead Sea. Needless to say, the Bible code has been heavily debunked, thanks in part to the long history of textual revisions of biblical manuscripts. In other words, the Bible we have now isn't identical to the original versions. The Bible's Book of Revelation is basically a fever dream of epic proportions. It describes the fiery end of the world, and the Book of Revelation can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Here's the big old story behind the Bible's Book of Revelation. 
Many people interpret Revelation as a sign of what's going to happen in the future, but for its author, it wasn't a mystic prophecy of something that was going to occur thousands of years later. It was actually both a rousing propaganda message and revenge fantasy all in one. According to Elaine Pagels, one of the world's foremost biblical scholars, the author of Revelation had just lived through an unimaginable catastrophe. In 70 CE, an armed Jewish revolt in Jerusalem was put down by 60,000 Roman soldiers who also burned down the temple and destroyed the city. As far as the revolutionaries were concerned, this was not how things were supposed to go. Early followers of Jesus didn't think his return was something far off, but very soon, even in their lifetimes. He was supposed to come back and destroy Rome, the empire that killed him. Instead, Rome was the one winning and Jesus was nowhere to be found. What had happened to the plan? So the author of Revelation, known only as John, wrote a book about how Jesus would return and annihilate his enemies, the Romans. He was writing anti-Roman propaganda and a rousing motivational track. The aim was to make sure that followers of Jesus didn't give up or despair. He was definitely going to come back and kick butt very soon. The Bible isn't the first book you might turn to for gratuitous violence, but it's definitely in there, and Revelation doesn't skimp. Everyone has heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but less well known are the horses of Revelation chapter 9 verses 17 through 19, which have the heads of lions and tails made of snakes. These particular horses are said to breathe fire, smoke, and sulfur, and they wind up killing a third of all humans. Of course, there are your standard horrible plague symptoms, like non-believers getting painful sores all over their bodies, being boiled alive by the sun, or giant hailstones falling to the earth and splatting people. But there are also some set pieces Hollywood would be proud of, like when the sun goes black and the moon turns to blood, or a dragon shows up and almost eats an infant. Two of the most bizarre elements of the book have to be the locusts and the wine press. The former descend on the earth, but are given scorpion stings, which they use to not kill humans, but to torture them for five months. The wine press is used to smush people to pulp until their blood is flowing five feet deep through the streets. There's so much crazy that occurs throughout the book, it's no wonder Revelation says mankind will, quote, long to die. Unfortunately for the people of Earth, they'll get no such luck. Considering how much Revelation has influenced the world, it's extremely concerning that it probably shouldn't have been included in the Bible at all. Christianity existed for hundreds of years without an official Bible. There were plenty of books being passed around, but no one had decided what was considered legit. Around 360 years after Jesus died, the process of putting together Christianity's holy book began, and Elaine Pagel says perhaps no one had more say over what made it into the New Testament than Bishop Athanasius. Described as pugnacious and fiery, this controversial dude managed to get deposed and exiled a whopping five times in his 46 years as a bishop. He also absolutely loved Revelation. He didn't love it because it spoke to him on a deeply spiritual level, but because he saw its potential as a way to attack any Christian who questions his authority. Instead of non-believers and Romans being the enemy described in Revelation, he saw the bad guys as the people of his own religion who didn't do and say exactly what he thought they should. Including Revelation in the Bible meant he could threaten perceived heretics with that weird winepress stuff. Athanasius would probably have been a fan of another form of brutal Christianity from several centuries later, because as they say, Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! <laughs> Interestingly, many church leaders wanted to see Revelation end up in the scrap heap instead of closing out the Bible. Athanasius' predecessor called it, quote, unintelligible, irrational, and false. Not a rousing endorsement of what some people now see as God's actual words. Especially since, you know, in the end, Athanasius got his way. Though the author of Revelation is considered a saint and an all-around important guy in various Christian churches, he wasn't a big fan of the people who actually started those religions. To an even greater extreme than St. Peter, John was Jewish through and through. In the early years of the church, there wasn't one agreed-upon way to be a Christian. Different sects were fighting to become the biggest and most correct. The John who wrote Revelation was very much of the idea that Jesus had come to the earth to be the Jewish Messiah. This put him at odds with Paul, the guy who, more than anything, shaped the version of Christianity that won. John wanted traditional Jewish values to continue. He didn't like the Gentiles could become followers of Jesus without adhering to the rules set out in the Torah, and he was definitely against women in power. At one point in Revelation, he refers to a woman who was a leader in an early church community as a, quote, Jezebel, and he was not exactly a fan of intermarriage between Jewish followers of Jesus and Gentile believers. It didn't even want the new churches to accept Gentile members, calling one that did a synagogue of Satan. Even at the time, these views would have seemed old-fashioned to many new Christians. 
It makes sense that John's version of the budding religion was the one that died out quickly. It would appear that some people have gotten their ideas about the Antichrist and the sign of the beast, 666, not from actually reading Revelation, but from watching the Omen. 666 and the beast were never supposed to represent a future evil Antichrist who Jesus would return and defeat. Revelation is just lousy with numerology. For example, the number 7 shows up constantly, and 666 is very much part of that. The verse in question that evokes the famous number says, Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. The number was never meant to be random. It stood for a very specific name, that of the Emperor Nero. Christians had good reason to absolutely hate Nero since he'd cracked down on the religion violently. There was even a rumor he used Christians as torches in his garden by burning them alive. He was the ultimate baddie, so he got specially singled out as an evil beast. John couldn't get away with openly writing bad stuff about Nero, so he used the Jewish numerology system, which the right readers would have easily been able to crack. Nor is the mark of the beast actually on the beast, it's on everyone else. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 through 17 says the beast makes everyone on earth get this mark, or they won't be able to buy and sell anything. Elaine Pagel says this might have stood for Roman imperial stamps, coins, or even actual tattoos. Since Revelation is often interpreted as the story of a future apocalypse, it gets cited as proof of an upcoming end of days by a lot of people. In the old days, it wasn't people you'd consider crazies either. Scotsman John Napier, born in 1550, is celebrated for his contributions to math and science, but less so for his writing on Revelation that predicted the world would end in 1688 or 1700. Conveniently for Napier, he'd be six feet under by that point, so he'd never find out he was wrong. Same with the German pastor Johann Bengel, who calculated the thousand-year reign of Christ prophesied in Revelation would begin in 1836. Even David Koresh of the Branch Davidian cult saw himself as the lamb mentioned in Revelation, and was preparing to open the seven seals to bring on the end times, which he took to mean that apparently he should publish a book. Koresh and many of his cult members died in Waco, Texas in 1993 dark day in U.S. history. More recently, a secretive conspiracy theorist who goes by the pseudonym David Mead interpreted a description of a woman in Revelation in an interesting way. He claimed that the description implied that a complicated astronomical combination of the constellation Virgo, the planet Jupiter, the moon, the sun, and various other stars and planets would bring on the beginning of the end. He first announced this would happen September 23, 2017. Being wrong didn't dissuade Meade, and he set the for real date as April 23, 2018. Unless we didn't notice something, it looks like that one missed too. If you ever wanted to visit a holy place and get a nice Mediterranean vacation out of it as well, the Cave of the Apocalypse should be on your list. John wrote in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 that he was on the Greek island of Patmos when he received his vision and dictated it to his disciple Prochorus. However, the claim that we found the exact cave he did this in is only based on legend. Still, it's important enough historically that both the cave and the monastery built around it in the Middle Ages were granted UNESCO World Heritage status in 1999. Despite the lack of proof, the Cave of the Apocalypse, now usually called the Holy Grotto, has been a popular pilgrimage destination for hundreds of years. Visitors still show up by the thousands. The entrance is now surrounded by the monastery, but you are allowed to go in the cave itself. There's a mosaic showing John getting his visions and the cleft in the rock where the voice of Christ supposedly came from. A fenced-off area is alleged to be where John slept every night, though no one seems to care where poor Prochorus got his Z's. There's even the rock John used as a pillow. The indentation his head made from repeated use is outlined in silver. To add to this realism, a monk sits on the rock and tells visitors how the book is written. Once you get your spiritual fill, it's time for Uzo. Opa! Opa! <laughs> Revelation stands out in the Bible because it's so drastically different in style and tone from virtually all the other books. That's because it's the only example of apocalypse literature that's made it into the final cut. But it's far from the only religious tome from that time that covered trippy end-of-the-world scenarios. Jewish authors started writing apocalypse literature around 300 BCE. They were heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism of the Persians, as well as the destruction of Jerusalem a couple of hundred years before. This genre of writing usually included a cosmic battle between good and evil, one or more messiahs showing up to fix everything, and an end to the current terrible times, giving way to a wonderful age. Written around 90 CE, the Book of Revelation is actually a pretty late addition to this canon. While it's the only official biblical apocalypse book, Revelation does have some unofficial competition. At almost the exact same time John was dictating his vision on the island of Patmos, someone was writing for Ezra. 
It was taken seriously as a holy book by many of the early church fathers and by Christians in general well into the Middle Ages. Christopher Columbus even cited it as proof that there was a lot more land than water on the earth. In general, 4 Ezra isn't as over the top as Revelation, but it still relays plenty of crazy visions about the end times. Evangelicals have an inordinate amount of influence on the United States Middle East policy, specifically when it comes to Israel. If a politician isn't evangelical themselves, they still want that large voting bloc to support them, which means sometimes supporting a foreign policy based on Revelation. One former Liberty University student wrote in America Magazine that in college, he was taught the establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948 was proof the end times were nigh. According to the evangelical interpretation of Revelation, before Jesus can come back, Jewish people have to return to Israel, rebuild the temple, and accept Christ as their savior. This will trigger the end times. So the establishment of Israel was evidence it's the beginning of the end, and protecting Israel's existence is vital for the fulfillment of the events that take place in Revelation. In fact, a 2015 survey found 73% of evangelicals believe events in Israel are part of the prophecies in the book of Revelation. This was why it was such a big deal for evangelicals when President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem in May 2018. They saw it as another fulfilled prophecy. The book of Revelation means different things to different people. It all comes down to which of the four main ways they interpret it. The four horsemen in Revelation stand for war, famine, death, and either Christ or the Antichrist, depending on who you ask. But even then, what they mean for the world is totally contingent on which of those four ways you read the book. Using preterminism, we've got nothing to worry about. People who take this view think John was talking about events that already happened, between the ministry of John the Baptist and the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In other words, the four horsemen have come and gone. But believers in futurism think nothing mentioned in the book has happened yet. Every single thing is going to occur sometime in the future, so we've got a lot of terrible destruction to look forward to. On the third hand, historicism says we're in the middle of the events of Revelation right now. They started 900 years ago, and some of the horsemen have already been causing trouble, while others are still to come. Finally, allegory means taking a purely spiritual view of Revelation. Nothing in it is literal. It's a symbolic story that's meant to be interpreted by individuals. Any death, famine, and war the world is going through is entirely non-horseman related. So what's the truth? That's for you to decide. You just better hurry.